Hello, everyone. Are you guys able to hear me? All right, let me wait for some responses before I move on. <laughs> Hi, Carrie. Hello, everyone. Wonderful. OK, so today we have a pretty action packed um, presentation, so we're going to go ahead and get started. OK, so. Our agenda for today is going to be uh, just quickly introducing you guys to some notes that Milani wrote for us. And also going over chapter 24 and chapter 25. Um, we're going to move at a pretty fast pace today. There's a lot of information to cover. Um, so if you guys ever need me to slow down, please just let me know so that I can um, make sure that I'm slowing down. Our group member spotlight for today is from Osceola County, and then we're going to review what the assignments for next week are. Okay, so Milani's notes, uh, Milani Dickinson was one of our members from cohort one, and what she essentially did was she put together a two-page document that kind of outlines what she did to study. As we previously discussed, there's been people who've prepared for this exam who have read all chapters in all three of the volumes and passed the exam, but there have also been others like myself and Milani who uh, we didn't actually read every single chapter and were able to pass the exam. So what she did was she broke it up into the different APIC text volumes one, two, and three. And she kind of let you know what she read from every book, the chapters that she thought were the most important for when she took her exam. And then and on her second page, there's some additional information um, and also some tips that she has for you guys when taking the exam. So uh, you guys should be receiving that from me um, today at some point in the afternoon. I do have to go pick up some swabs after the presentation, so it might be later in the afternoon than usual, but yes, so that's for you guys to really use and to read through so that you're able to kind of see how other people have prepared who have been successful at passing her exam, their exams, sorry. Okay, so for today we're we're on week two of the group and we're gonna be focusing on chapters 24 and chapter 25, which are very similar. Um, in order for you to be really successful at preparing for this test and, and also having kind of the best results with being a part of the study group, you're gonna wanna make sure that you're completing your weekly assigned readings. The reason being is that a lot of the information that I need to go over is very detailed and in order for you to make sure that you're following along and that you're understanding everything that happens is really helpful for you to have already some ideas of what is what it is that I'm going to be talking about if you're just coming on and listening to the lecture that's great but um, it's really supposed to be supplemental to to how you're preparing additionally you know the assigned chapter readings are what I feel you guys really need to make sure that you're going over and looking over but that does not mean that you shouldn't also be aiming to have some of these additional chapters read okay and have your how you're performing on your practice exams guide you on what you need to review because if you're an epi you might be really familiar with the diarrheal diseases and this might be chapter 79 might be something that you don't need to read because you are already knowledgeable so instead of reading this then focus on maybe CJD or you need to learn a little bit more about staphylococci or streptococci so because this these are your assigned readings doesn't um, necessarily mean you you know it's good if you read them but if you're already not if you are already knowledgeable in that area try to tailor your studying to your strengths and weaknesses I cannot stress that enough okay so we're gonna get started with chapter 24 microbiology basics Okay, so microbiology basics. Uh, so when it comes to microbio, it provides an IP fundamental knowledge of microorganisms, their identification, significance, and basic laboratory techniques um, to basically like help you understand what you're looking at when you're an IP. There's a lot of laboratory components in these first two chapters, but I feel it's really important. If you have any type of uh, laboratory background, I feel like these chapters are probably very easy for you, but the majority of the time, um, I feel that this is kind of an area that people need a little bit more help on because it is very lab oriented. So clinical microbiology laboratories can provide information on microbes determined to be of clinical significance. And this really um, is about you working with your labs, whether you're an ambulatory center or a hospital, you wanna make sure that you're in constant communication with your lab because 
they know what they see every single day and if they come across a pathogen that is really odd their susceptibility pattern is not what they're used to seeing they're going to be able to communicate with you so it's important that you're involving them in um in aspects of infection control in your infection control committees um, also for the exam and for practice um, i know this group is primarily to help you prepare for the exam but but also just for those of you that are already in those roles as ips um, proper specimen collection and transport are very important and you will be tested on that so you need to know this um, the majority of the things i've put on these powerpoint slides are things that you do you need to make sure that you have knowledge of for the exam so bacteria are astoundingly small now, now that's just a generic kind of statement but it's really important to always keep this in mind because if you think about it an almost like invisible crack in an endoscope could have numerous bacteria in it and so when it comes to all the different aspects of infection control whether it's hand hygiene um, environmental cleaning and disinfection sterilization always keeping that in mind that these microorganisms are invisible and that they're extremely small should help put into perspective how important infection control is. Now some bacteria can transform into endospores. Endospores are always fun. Um, so bacillus and thrasis, what disease does that cause? Anthrax, very good. Clostridium tetani? tetanus very good uh, C diff we have pseudomembranous colitis what about clostridium perfringens perfringens sorry <laughs> gas gangrene very good Liza very good okay and what about uh, clostridium botulinum botulinum how you say it Botulism. Okay, Cheryl, Maria, Carrie, you guys are doing awesome. Uh, so microbiology includes the study of bacteria, fungi, which are your mold and yeast, protozoa, viruses, and algae. So there's a lot. There's a lot you got to know when it comes to microbiology, but it's fun. I just wanted to share this with you guys because I think endospores are so cool. So we're going to take a quick minute to appreciate these little guys and how just amazing they are at surviving and so this is kind of like endospore formation so how they're formed so you start out with your vegetative cell which is basically the cell that's active it's trying to get its food it's trying to stay alive and then basically something's happened the environment whether it's a disinfectant whether it's antibiotics whether it's whatever it is um, it's basically putting the cell in danger so you have the chromosome that's duplicated and it's separated and so it starts forming its little spore over here and you can see that it just continues and it continues and it gets coated and it starts to mature and so then you have your endospore basically in here while there's a little bit of other part of the cell trying to still kind of keep going and find some form of staying alive but as time continues the vegetative part just starts to be become smaller and smaller and smaller and then you have your endospore so just a little bit of a of of a endospore formation because I, I like endospores they're difficult and you'll get questions about them on the test so bacterial shapes and arrangements this comes back to one of the chapters that i asked you guys to read previously of uh, bacterial taxonomy i feel like that chapter does a really great job of explaining um, the shapes and arrangements of cells but also in chapter um, 24 they go over this so you have your caucus right which is this one right here it's that kind of round spherical um, shape you have your bacillus which is the rod the rod like um, you have your vibrio here we have these beautiful little vibrio bugs you have spirillium right spirochete what what std is a spirochete let's see very good gina syphilis correct no not gonorrhea not gonorrhea gonorrhea is a different one it's what 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 shape does gonorrhea come in i'll give you a clue it's up here 
Yes, good job, Liza. Cockeye, very correct. They're diplococci and they're gram negative when you look at them under the microscope. And then we have these branching filaments, and these are more when it comes to your hyphae, so your fungi, um, and that's what they look like. And the reason why it's important for you guys to know this is because at times, not just for laboratory purposes, but in the exam, there will be times when they won't necessarily tell you exactly what organism you're looking at, but they'll describe it to you, and then you'll need to um, identify what it is. Okay. All right, so bacterial arrangement and size. So here we have the arrangement. So we have monococcus, mono one, diplo two. So this would be what gonorrhea looks like. You have tetra, bacillus, diplobacillus, staphylococcus. So staph right here, what is this? Clusters. Often staph is gonna be, um, so often staph is going to be like a cluster of grapes. It's gonna be you know, described as a cluster of grapes. What about strep? Strep means chains. So you need to keep these shapes and these names in mind, right? So staphylococcus, streptococcus, there's a reason why they're named that. Um, and so remember these over here, pairs, diplo, chains, strepto, cluster, staph. And then we have um, all other types of shapes here. Um, palisade bacillus, streptobacillus, you see strepto, chains of bacilli. So really break down the meanings of the words and keep this in mind for when you're doing, you know, for when you're studying and you're answering your questions. Gram positive and gram negative. So we are, you will get a question about gram positive and gram negative bacteria. I am willing to bet you $2, okay? You will get it on the test. You'll get it on your practice questions. So it's really important that you're familiar with these concepts and that they are solidified, well understood, and well delineated in your brain. So on the left, we have the gram positive, um, the gram positive cell wall, right? So the cell, the outer membrane layer, the peptidoglycan and the cell membrane, right? So what, what are the differences, like the main difference that you see between these two cells when it comes to peptidoglycan between the gram positive and the gram negative? Ashley, correct, thick wall. So it's a thick wall, it's a thick wall of a of peptidoglycan layer. Um, another really important um, factor here is we have the, the tachoic acid and the lipotachoic acid. This is an important polysaccharide that's present in the gram-positive cell wall. It acts as an antigenic determinant, so it's really important for serologic identification of many gram-positive species. So when you're seeing tachoic acid or lipotachoic acid in your questions, you should be immediately thinking of gram-positive. And the thick, this thick gram-positive, um, sorry, this, pep, this thick peptidoglycan glycan layer, this is what's going to allow for that crystal violet to really bind and to come off as that purple color. As you can see here, the peptidal glycan layer in the gram negative is much smaller. There's a lot of different components uh, to both gram positive and gram negative bacteria, but for now, really focus on the tachoic acid, knowing the differences between peptidal glycan, gram positive is thick, gram negative, sometimes it's just one layer, sometimes it could be two, but it's it's a lot, um, you know, it's just, it's significantly smaller. So the Graham scene procedure, here we have the beautiful Hans Christian Graham. He is the person who just developed the Graham scene in 1884. We need to give him a shout out because, because of him, we are able to differentiate, differentiate between gram positive and gram negative um, bacteria. So thank you, Mr. Graham, you the boss. Um, so it delineates our two major groups of bacteria. And once again, the difference lies in the structure of the cell envelope. So this is what the gram positive and gram negative stain is going to look like. We, many of us have done this in lab. It may be a couple years since we've done a gram stain. We, some of us may have just done it yesterday. Um, so it just really depends on what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, as an epi, I can tell you, I don't, I don't do gram, stain, gram stains, um, but I, I do have to know about them. So they use the crystal violet to, um, you know, once you've fixed your bacteria onto your slide, you use the crystal violet and you pour it over your slide. You, 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 then you use the iodine, which is a dye complex that's trapped in the wall for the gram positive, and it has no effect, right? For alcohol, this is when the crystals remain in the cell wall for our gram positives, and then it's kind of washed away for the gram negatives. And then 
you know, the red dye is masked by the violet with the, the crystal violet, but the saffronin red dye does stain our gram negatives. So this is what the process look like, looks like, and um, that's how we're able to really differentiate from our gram positive and gram negative. So that's a really quick um, synopsis of what the gram stain is like. So let's do a quick concept check. In a gram stain procedure, gram positive bacteria stain purple because A, they have lipopolysaccharide layers in their cell wall that is decolorized with alcohol. B, their cell wall contains long chain fatty acids that take up crystal violet easily. C, they have a thick peptidoglycan cell wall that retains the primary stain during the alcohol decolorization, and the primary stain is crystal violet. And D is gram staining is simple staining, so the only stain used is crystal violet. Okay, very good. You are all getting C, so that lets me know that you understand that concept. And when you're answering these questions, right, when you're answering these sample questions or preparing for the exam, you need to start thinking of how can I cancel out answers? Lipopolysaccharide layer in their cell wall, you're already thinking gram negative. Long chain fatty acids, you're not thinking of gram positive. So long chain fatty acids, you're thinking of a different type of bacteria, right? Acid fast bacteria. And then for gram staining, it's a simple stain, so they only use crystal violet, that's incorrect. You know they also use safranin. So start thinking of how you can cancel out answers to lower, to lower your options. All right, another concept check. You have isolated a bacterium from your skin. Chemical analysis shows that it contains proteins, peptidoglycan, lipids, DNA, and tachoic acid. What sort of bacteria is this? A, gram positive, B, gram negative, or C, you cannot tell from this information. Okay, so we have a lot of A's and C's. So when you're looking at this question, you need to look at peptidoglycan and your tachoic acid, right? We were just talking about this. So tachoic acid, you're gonna see it in gram positive. So um, we had a couple people putting C. So just make sure that these concepts are reviewed. Um, if you're not, if you're not getting it, make sure you go back and you read through it and you watch a couple YouTube lectures to, to ensure that this is really solidified. So let's move on to our acid fast bacteria. So these are going to be mycobacteria. They lack a cell wall, so these different types of dyes are not really able to bind to them. Um, they contain mycolic acid, which are these very long chains of fatty acids, right? And it's, it's a waxy surface that's impervious to chemicals or dyes, which is why you can't stain them with the crystal violet or the safranin. Some important pathogens that are acid fast are going to be your tuberculosis, your mycobacterium leprae or leprosy, and also opportunistic wound infections. And they grow inside macrophage, like uh, ins inside a mac macrophage. So this is... Um, yeah, this is fun for TB, so we're going to talk a little bit more about acid-fast bacteria uh, in next week's lecture. So this is what the acid-fast stain is like. Um, you know, the cells of these bacteria contain, once again, those very long chains of fatty acids that makes them impervious to crystal violet and other basic dyes. So you need to utilize heat or detergents um, in order to basically force the dye into this type of cell. And you can see you apply a primary stain of carbo, oof, carbo fusion, and then you use heat to fix it. You decolorize with an acid, and then you apply a counter stain of methylene blue to basically be able to differentiate between your acid fast organisms and your non acid fast organisms. So, acid fast stains. Acid fast stains are very useful in identifying your mycobacterium, your nocardia species, and um, actinomyces. Um, so these, the way they like to confuse you on the exam with these is that they'll kind of pull different types of acid fast um, bacteria into a question and you kind of essentially have to figure out which one they may be talking about. Um, so you just need to make sure that uh, for chapter 95, which is tuberculosis and other mycobacteria, that you're reading that in detail. Now, mycobacteria, besides the stain, they do require special culture techniques in order to be isolated. So once the specimen is actually um, processed, 
it needs to be incubated in special media for four to six weeks. So this is a really long um, process. Uh, so keep that in mind when it comes to mycobacteria, it's a long process in order to get that culture. So they'll use other methods, um, PCR to basically come to a conclusion on what is growing because even once the organism grows in the culture there's further testing that needs to be done in order to identify which species it is of mycobacteria so it's it's a hot mess express it takes a while so the calcifloor white stain now when you're looking at these stains number one they're beautiful but number two what are you looking at what are we looking at right now are we looking at bacteria are we looking at a virus <laughs> Ashley, very good job, Ashley Joseph. She said fungus in all capitals. Right, okay. So, Calcifloor White is a special fluorescent stain that binds to the um, chitinin cell walls of the fungi. So, adding Calcifloor White stain to the slide will cause the fungi to become fluorescent, making them easier to identify under a fluorescent microscope. Now let's talk a little bit about bacteria and their genetic diversity. So this is kind of a picture here that talks about conjugation, um, which we'll further define in another in the next slide. But so the genome, genome change can occur not only by mutation, but also by transfer of genes from one bacteria to another. Can you guys tell me of um, what are some ways that, that gene transfer can occur? I know conjugation is one, but can you think of so plasmids that would that would fall under conjugation transformation very good sarah there's one more okay um, that's okay. So acquisition of an R plasmid can render a bacterium and its descendants immediately resistant to antibiotics if resistant genes are encoded on the plasmids. And plasmids are these DNA molecules that are generally circular and they're not really like essential to the microbes. So they're able to kind of exchange these like trading cards. So for example, you know, you could have a, um, a, a strep that's coming into contact with, uh, um, let's see, what kind of French should we get him? A serratia. And they use these plasmids as sort of trading cards. Like, oh, hey, you're, you're, res you know, you're resistant to amicacin? Cool. Uh, well, I'm resistant to meropenem. Do you want to like kind of switch these and, and exchange this? And that's how it happens. So that's conjugation. And that's a really simple way of explaining it. But this is why we're having all of these different, all of this antibiotic resistance happening because they're bacteria are trying to survive and so they're trying to exchange as much information in order to survive and be able to um, move forward and pa pass this down to the next line of cells or bacteria. Okay, so here we have transformation, conjugation, and transduction. Uh, Liza got it, yes. <laughs> transformation, conjugation, and transduction. So for transformation, it occurs when naked DNA in the environment, possibly from dead bacteria, enters another bacterium. So here we have our little bacteria, and unfortunately, it can no longer go on. And so you have your little DNA over here that is going to get scooped up by another bacteria. For conjugation, it occurs when all parts of a plasmid are transferred from a donor, so here we have our donor, to our recipient cell. And they need to be in direct contact. And conjugation is going to happen basically through their um, their sex uh, pillus, and um, and they're able to exchange that information. Now, transduction is when we have a bacterial DNA that's transferred to a donor cell, right? Sorry, from that's transferred from a donor cell to a recipient cell via a virus capable of infecting a bacteria. Now, what is the name for a virus that's capable of infecting a bacteria? I'll give you a clue. It starts, it's bacterio. <laughs> yes, yes, Ashley, Joseph, good job, bacteriophage, good job. Let's move on. All right, viruses are neither eukaryotes or prokaryotes. 
um, viruses are viruses are kind of uh, in their own little world. You know, people don't really agree. It, it, it's kind of a big debate in the community of whether they're alive, whether they're not alive. Um, you know, what the situation station is with viruses, and so. What we can say about them is that they're obligate intracellular parasites, which means that they need to reproduce within living cells. Because what they do is once they're inside a cell, they utilize the host machinery in order to be able to replicate these chains of proteins. And they use different types of, you know, a reverse transcriptase or other, you know, other components um, to be able to replicate once they're inside a cell, right? So, yeah, they... Yeah, viruses are fun. Uh, what type of microscope do you utilize to look at a virus? Very good job, Tamika. Yes, an electron microscope. Correct. So the virion is when it's actually outside of the host cell and it's metabolically in metabolically inert, which means it does not grow or multiply until it enters the host cell. You have three major ways to diagnose viral infections. You have direct detection in the clinical specimen. You have specific antibody assay to detect viral antibodies in the serum. And then you have viral culture. So for, um, for your diagnosis of viral infections, you have electron microscopy, which we already, we already know that you utilize that. You have your ELISA, your enzyme-linked immunoabsorbent assay, latex agglutination, DNA probes, PCR for DNA detection of viruses, OIA, which is optical immunoassay, which is an antigen-based test that produces a reflection change for the detection of influenza viruses. You have light microscopy cell scrapings, um, which can help you identify um, cowdery type A inclusion bodies from herpes simplex virus. You have your pap smears, which are used for to identify lots of different things, but HPV, good job. Yes. Um, ooh. Negri bodies? I'm not sure if I'm saying this one correctly, so I apologize. Um, but what do you what do you find those on when, when you're trying to oh Ashley, Ashley Joseph, you're such a queen. You're answering so quickly. Yes, rabies. Um, and then lastly, virus cultures require specialized media containing antibacterial and antifungal agents in order to grow. Okay. So for microscopic slide preparations, uh, direct examination or direct wet mounts of clinical specimens should be performed as soon as possible after collection. So this is for direct examination or a direct wet mount. You want to do this as like basically as soon as possible. Um, examples of specimens examined by direct wet mounts include sputum, drainage from lesions, body fluid aspirates, stool, vaginal discharge, and urine sediment. So some examples of pathogens that can be identified by direct wet mounts include Giardia lamblia, Trichomonas vaginalis, um, and Entamoeba histolytica from a liver abscess, okay? Now let's talk about bacterial pure cultures. So when it comes to cultures, you have choices of what to include in your Petri dish, right? And the incubation conditions are really are really critical for the growth and identification of the proper bacteria. So the choice of your media is going to depend on three three things: the site being cultured, throat, blood, is it urine, sputum, the growth requirements of common or suspected pathogens. So what are you kind of suspecting? What do you think it more than likely is? That's going to help you identify what type of media you need to use, and then the likelihood that normal flora are going to be present. So let's see who actually did their readings. Okay, so for nutrient agar, what does nutrient agar support um, the growth of? This is gonna be on the test. Okay, we don't have any answers, but this will be on the test. Um, so just make sure you review it. So it supports the growth of a wide variety of bacteria. And agar is a polysaccharide gel, right? It's a polysaccharide gel, which is going to, um, which is basically going to feed your little friends, your microbes, your bacteria while they're growing. Now, TSA, right? 
TSA stands for tryptocase soy agar, is one of those nutrient agars which you can utilize. Um, you can utilize, you know, you can add different things to it. You can utilize 5% sheep's blood. It could just be tryptocase soy agar without any sheep's blood. But that's an, that's a, an example of a nutrient agar. Now, an enrichment medium. What is enrichment medium utilized for? Okay, so we have to grow bacteria, Neisseria. Hard to grow organisms, fastidious, very good. So they contain special nutrients necessary for the growth of fastidious bacteria. So fastidious means they're hard to grow. I mean, the word alone, fastidious, just sounds unpleasant. I mean, if you say it to yourself, fastidious. It just doesn't sound good. Yeah, so it's hard to grow. And Ashley, you were correct. So chocolate agar is utilized for the growth of Neisseria meningitis. Now, selective media. What is selective media utilized for? Okay, selective media contains chemicals or antibiotics designed to inhibit normal commensal bacteria. And so normal commensal bacteria are going to be the normal, you know, bacteria or microbiome that's, that's on a person's body. So bismuth sulfate agar can be utilized for the isolation of salmonella species. And differential media, I did see someone put differentiating bacteria. Um, so it stains colonies of specific organisms while inhibiting the growth of others. So acetate agar is utilized to differentiate between E. coli from Shigella. Okay. So let's go over the effects of oxygen on the growth of various types of bacteria. This will be on the test. Um, and the way that they're going to ask you questions are going to be, um, they'll basically tell you uh, this microbe can only grow, um, let's see, can only, okay, oxygen is, for in order for this microbe to grow, it requires um, low oxygen, concentrations of low oxygen. And then they'll give you all these different types of options, like it's an obligate aerobe, a facultative anaerobe, an obligate anaerobe, atolerant anaerobes, or a microaerophile. And then you have to decide what the answer is. So for an obligate anaerobe, it's only aerobic growth. So oxygen is required in order for it to grow. And you can see here in this tube that there are all to the top because they need that oxygen in order to be able to grow. Now for a facultative anaerobe, it's both aerobic and anaerobic growth, and it's greater in the presence of oxygen. So as you can see, you have more bacteria growing towards the top of the tube where that oxygen is present, but it can also occur, so it can also change. So um, a, fac a facultative anaerobe uh, basically makes ATP by aerobic ex by aerobic respiration if oxygen is present, but it's also capable of switching to fermentation, right, if oxygen is absent. So we have our, our fermenters down here doing their thing. An obligate anaerobe, um, only anaerobic growth, so it cannot exist in the presence of oxygen, which is why you see here that there's none towards the top where the oxygen would be. And only anaerobic growth, but continues in the presence of oxygen. So it kind of grows evenly. Oxygen has no effect. Um, I feel like they don't have as many questions on aerotolerant, or they don't touch on aerotolerant anaerobes as much. And then you have your microaerophiles, um, only aerobic growth. Oxygen is required in really low concentrations. And you can see that they're kind of towards the middle of the tube. So let's do a quick concept check. Um, microorganisms are grown on culture media made, oh wait, I apologize. <laughs> um, a microbe that can grow in the absence of oxygen but is also able to utilize oxygen for growth is a, So we have some C's and we have some B's. So this is an uh, this is a microbe that can grow in the absence of oxygen, but is also able to utilize oxygen for its growth. So in a tube, that would look like some of the bacteria are towards the top, 
add, but there's still some in the bottom, right? So what does that look like? This one right here, right? Facultative anaerobe. Okay, so microorganisms are grown on a culture media made of an agar base. Additive to the me media vary according to growth requirements of organisms and or the desire to select out a specific organism. Fastidious organisms require blank media and blank media is used to inhibit normal commensals. So we have the different options here. I'll give you guys a second to think about this one. Very good, you guys are all getting this really quickly. So yes, it is B. We have um, enrichment media and then selective, right? Because that goes back to our previous slide. A couple of you did miss it. So just make sure that if you are not able or if you're not getting these concepts that you're going back and reviewing, okay? Okay, so fastidious organisms require enrichment media. Which media is used to inhibit normal commensals? This is another example of the type of questions you could get on the exam. So here we, once again, we have selective. Okay, um, most, of, most, most of you got that one, so that's good. All right, an example of a selective media that inhibits gram-positive bacteria is so you're thinking of selective media that inhibits gram-positive bacteria. So this is where making sure that you are going through your text and reading things in detail is going to be really important because these are the kind of questions that you're going to get and you need to be able to separate these into what they're what they are. So you should already be thinking B and C we just reviewed. So B right? That's an enrichment media, chocolate agar for Neisseria, tryptocase soy agar or TSA, that's going to be a nutrient. So that already, B and C are not it. So then you have A and D left, correct? You have A and D left as your choices. So the answer is McConkie's agar. That's going to be, um, that's going to be the, the answer for this one. And, uh, oh, wait, what happened? Oh, I apologize. Yes, okay, so um, an example of a medium that's selective for gram-negative bacteria is McConkie's agar, which contains crystal violet and bile sauce to inhibit the growth of gram-positive bacteria. All right, so the catalase test and coagulase test. So can anyone tell me what you would utilize the catalase test for? You're using it to differentiate between two types of bacteria. We have a strep versus staph. Very good, Sarah. Yes, it's going to be strep versus staph. So the catalyzed test is used to differentiate between streptococci, which would be negative, and staphylococci, which would be positive. So this uses peroxide, and when they come into contact with it, you'll see it bubble. It bubbles. It's, it's pretty fun. Um, and then for the coagulase test, you have, it's utilized to differentiate between Staphylococcus aureus from other Staphylococci species, such as Staphylococcus um, epidermidis. Epidermidis? Epidermidis? Oh, bendito. So yes, um, so we have this here. The way that they're going to ask you questions about this on the exam is they're basically going to try to trick you and they're going to put different types of bacteria in there in order to basically determine if you know the application of these tests. So do you know that you need to utilize the catalase test to differentiate between strep and staph? And do you know that you need the coagulase test between S. aureus and S. epidermidis? So they might say, they might say something like, um, you have uh, Bobby Joe presents to the ED um, and you're concerned that they could have a this type of infection, uh, a strep infection, which type of test would you utilize in order to determine whether this is a strep infection? And then they'll give you coagulase test, coagulase test, catalyze, catalase test, and a couple other options. And then you have to determine which test to use. 
so it's not just you being able to memorize it, but also being able to kind of figure out why they want you to know this or what its application is. So let's move over to antimicrobial susceptibility testing, which is disk diffusion or the Kirby-Bauer method. So basically for the Kirby-Bauer method, you're going to have bacteria spread in a lawn fashion onto a mueller hidden agar. And then these paper disks, these little disks, which are impregnated with like a, a standard amount of antibiotic, are placed on the surface of that agar um, once your, ba your bacteria is already on there. So you're trying to figure out what, back, what antibiotics can I use? What antibiotics are going to actually work on, these, on, on this pathogen? Your agar plate is incubated overnight, and organism growth is either inhibited or it's not. Either it's stopping them from growing or it's not. Then you have your zone of in inhibition, which is the area in which the concentration of the antibiotic prohibits the growth of the organism. So this is what the Kirby-Bauer method looks like. And you see here that you have all different types of um, antibiotics here, right? And then you see the zone of inhibition here. So basically what your laboratorians are doing is that they're measuring those zones of inhibition and they're comparing them to the Clinical Laboratory Standard Institute's guidelines for interpretation, the CLSI uh, guidelines, and they're interpreting these results. So it's not, you can't just look at it and be like, mm, you know, this ampicillin, it looks a little small, like, I guess, you know, maybe that's intermediate. Um, I'm not really sure. Like, that's not how it works. They actually have to go in there, they have to measure it, and they have to determine based on guidelines um, what it means. So an S indicates it's susceptible. An I is intermediate, indicating that the agent, whatever antimicrobial you're using, is less effective um, than what a susceptible would be. And then R, it indicates that the antimicrobial agent should not be used for therapy at all because it doesn't work at all. So can you guys type in an antibiotic which is resistant on this plate? Just so I can make sure you guys are being able to interpret these. I'm getting a lot of penicillin, vancomycin. Very good, very good. Because you don't see that zone of inhibition there. Penicillin did nothing for this bug. It did nothing for E. coli. It's like, don't give this patient penicillin. It's not gonna help them, right? Now, we'll briefly touch on VIM. So here in the Central Florida area, we've been seeing uh, a VIM, which is Verona Integron Encoded Metallobeta-Lactamase producing Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And basically what this susceptibility pattern, this is what a susceptibility pattern would look like. So you see here your, mini, your minimum inhibitory, um, const, is it concentration? I can't remember, your MIC, and then you have your results. So we have our susceptible, intermediate, resistant. And so for this type of um, this type of mechanism of resistance that's attaching to the pseudomonas is producing a very specific susceptibility pattern where it's only susceptible to colistin and amicacin and essentially resistant to everything else, all your carbapenems. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's a very resistant, um, bacteria or mechanism of resistance. So this is how that is interpreted. And these are these criteria and these breakpoints, those are those CLSI guidelines. Now some additional tests that you need to make sure that you know, and we're already at 45 minutes, so I, and we are not, yeah, we're gonna have to follow up next week. We might need to do an additional meeting so that we don't get behind. Um, but you need to make sure that you're understanding disk diffusion, the E-test, the disk approximation test, broth dilution, beta-lactamase detection, and other additional tests which are on this chapter. These chapters, these, th these three chapters are really important for your exam. Now let's learn a little bit about specimen collection and transport. And you need to memorize this. I don't know if you need to you know, record yourself reading this like five times and then play it as you're driving or if you need to make uh, study cards, but you need to know this. You need to you need to be able to have a, you know, dinner conversation with people about these specimen collection and transport um, rules because it will be on the test. It will be on the test. I'm telling you right now, it will be on the test. So specimens should be collected aseptically and placed in a sterile container. Some specimens may be placed directly on culture media blood cultures or genital cultures, right? Special handling techniques may be necessary for some specimens like anaerobic cultures. Prompt delivery is essential. 
If transport is delayed, some specimens can be refrigerated, right? So urine, stool, and sputum, you can toss those in the refrigerator. Others need to be maintained at room temperature. Genital, eye, and spinal fluid. You guys need to know what can be refrigerated, what cannot be refrigerated, what needs to be maintained at room temperature. For example, your CSF, your cerebral spinal fluid, yeah, you can leave that at room temperature, but it needs to be at the lab within an hour. So you need to make sure that you're going over these specimen collections and transport guidelines and that you have them memorized. I can't really give you any tips on remembering it. You just need to know it. Now, as far as microbiological and environmental sampling, so uh, this is the last portion of, of chapter 24, right? So it's generally not recommended because it's really costly and requires special laboratory procedures. So there's no standard for comparison and the results, um, you know, may cause an implementation of unnecessary procedures or, or precautions that are really not needed. Uh, routine environmental monitor, monitoring um, or routine microbiological sampling for quality assurance purposes quality assurance purposes should be limited to biological monitoring of sterilization processes, monthly cultures and endotoxin testing of water and dialysate and hemodialysis units. This right here, B, it's in your dialysis chapter. Short-term evaluation of the impact of infection prevention measures or changes in infection prevention protocols, like evaluating a new cleaning procedure or product, like your UV lights or other things like that, or water culturing after Legionella abatement, right? And we spoke about what some methods for um, reducing Legionella were last during last lecture. Uh, special environmental monitoring used when epidemiological investigation suggests a source or reservoir exists. So if you're experiencing an outbreak and there's a possibility that there might be an environmental reservoir, yeah, you can definitely move forward to microbiological environmental sampling if your epi is pointing towards it. You can monitor uh, personnel, medical devices, air, water, food, or other surfaces. And then quantitative methods should be used to determine the amount of the burden. So overall, it's generally not recommended, right? So it's like we have this these very strict criteria that, that you need to meet in order to go and move on with environmental sampling. You don't, you don't just want to go around swabbing everywhere in the hospital or in your facility because that's not necessarily indicative of, of, of anything. Um, you, there's microbes everywhere, right? So you want to make sure that you're keeping these kind of guidelines in your mind because they will ask you questions about um, environmental cultures on the exam. Okay, question one. Lightning round, okay? I need you guys to be on your feet. Uh, the director of the operating room requests that the OR surfaces be routinely environmentally cultured. The IP's best response should be, A, a scheduled routine for culturing of the OR should be arranged so that each room is cultured at a set interval. B, routine culturing of the OR should be done in the absence of any epidemiologic investigations in that area. C, routine culturing should not be done because it is too expensive. And D, routine culturing should not be considered unless an epidemiologic investigation is being conducted. Great, you guys understand that concept. Everyone's putting D, let's move, move on. Okay, important considerations regarding blood culture specimens should include, one, collect prior to the initiation of antimicrobial therapy if you worked in the ER. You already know that's true. Two, collect from a central venous catheter whenever possible. Three, ensure that the volume of the specimen collected is sufficient. And four, culture of specific sites is not recommended for surveillance. Now you guys did get some help because I told you one was true. So you only have two options, you have A or C. And everyone's putting A, correct. A is correct. You're going to want to make sure that you collect them prior to initiation of, of antimicrobial therapy and that you ensure that the volume of the specimen collected is sufficient enough for the lab to process it. You receive a call from a young man who thinks he was exposed to HIV. His baseline HIV test, his ELISA, was negative. At what time period after exposure would we be most likely to detect HIV antibody, antibodies? So we have A, one to three months, B, three weeks, C, six months, and D, 12 months. We have some. A's and some C's and some B's, a lot of C's. Okay, 
one to three months. Now this is known as the window period, right? The window period for HIV. And I know as EPIs, many of us don't work with HIV, uh, since that's mostly done, at least here in Florida, that's done by the, by our STD counterparts. Um, but if you've ever been tested or if you've ever had, um, you know, any type of outreach event that you've done with, with your STD partners, um, you know, in your communities, they always talk to you about that window period and making sure that you come back and that you get retested in, in one to three months, right? And if you're really concerned about an exposure, you can do a NAT, right? A nucleic acid amplification test, which is able to identify it a lot more quickly. But let's move on. Okay, a physician orders a culture. Ova and parasite specimens on a 10-year-old boy admitted with diarrhea. A liquid stool specimen is collected from the patient at 9 p.m. The specimen is refrigerated until 9 a.m. the next day when the physician calls and requests that the lab look for amoebic trophozoites. Trophozoites? Trophozoites? Trophozoites. The best course of action is to A, perform a trichrome, trichrome that's supposed to be, there's supposed to be an R, I apologize, trichrome stain on the original specimen. B, request a fresh specimen. C, perform a concentration on the original stool specimen. And D, perform a saline wet mount on the original specimen. We have some Bs, we have some Ds, we have some Cs. So when you're reading this, right, for one, you should be thinking, okay, it's okay that they refrigerated it because the specimen is stool. So start finding ways to remember this information, right? They're looking for amoebic trophozoites. So when we learned a little bit earlier about wet mounds, there was a sentence in there that was very specific, right? So you can do wet mounds for looking for amoebic trophozoites, right? Like in Giardia lamblia, or it doesn't even need to be Giardia, but it could be anything else, right? You can, you can do wet mounds. So that one could be it, but the sentence specifically stated that you need to have fresh, a fresh specimen. So when you're looking for an amoebic trophozoite, you need to request a fresh specimen in order to be able to do that. Now performing a trichrome stain on the original specimen. So trichrome stains are utilized for ovas and parasites. So I guess you maybe you could. That's I guess that might be a, uh, the tricky question um, or the tricky part of this question. Uh, but you would still want to make sure that you are requesting a fresh specimen first. So patients with cell-mediated immunity dysfunction are susceptible to infections attributed to pathogenic intracellular bacteria. Examples of these organisms include these right here. I'm not going to read all of them. It's too many names, right? But your key, so the key, the key word that you're looking at here are intracellular bacteria, right? And this, this is straight up out of chapter 24, where they go through and they break down these different types of bacteria and they tell you whether they're an intracellular um, bacteria or not. So we have some varying answers. We have some Ds, we have some As. We have one C. Okay. And our C, Stacy. Stacy, you're correct. Yes. So it's going to be Salmonella typhi and Listeria monocytogenes. M monocytogenes? I don't know. The struggle. All right. Question six. An example of an obligate. Intracellular parasitic bacterium would be an organism responsible for hepatitis, Q fever, malaria, chlamydia. Just by reading that question alone, you should have already crossed off two answer choices. Two answer choices should have already been long gone. All right. So, parasitic bacterium. Is malaria a bacterium? Malaria is not a bacterium, so don't let them trick you. 
You see, they're trying to, they try to, you're, you're in, you're in the test, you're taking it and you're, you know, you're, you're trying to think and you're pulling all this knowledge. So you need to bring it back to the basics. Ask yourself, what do I know? What do I know about the pathogens that I'm looking at here on this, on this screen? I know malaria is not a bacteria, right? We know it's not. It's transmitted by mosquitoes. It's a parasite. Malaria, all of those fun plasmodiums. So you can already cross off A and C. So your options are B and D. They both include the two. So we know Q fever is one of them. Now we need to decide whether um, chlamydia or hepatitis is an intracellular parasitic bacterium. And at least, you know, you've got it down to a 50 50 shot now. By, by just being able to break down these questions. So B, all we get intracellular parasites cannot reproduce outside their host cell, meaning that the parasite reproduction is entirely reliant on intracellular resources. Obligate intracellular parasites of humans include viruses, certain bacteria, including chlamydia, rickettsias, um, mycobacterium, toxoplasma gondii, uh, cryptosporidium, um, Leishmania, Trypanosoma cruzi, and certain fungi such as Pneumocystis gyrovechi. Okay. Question seven Which of the following specimens can remain at room temperature after collection if transport to the lab will be delayed? Which of the following can. Look at, look at you, Maria. You know what, Maria? That is such a beautiful. Maria, you know what? Let me. You are, you are a beautiful specimen. So Maria said, hepatitis is a virus. So guys, guys, we didn't even need to know. We didn't even need to know what, what's an intracellular parasitic bacterium. We, they give us the answers from the, from the beginning. It's a trap. Ask yourself, what is the trap in the question? Very good job, Maria. Beautiful. Okay, question seven. Which of the following specimens can remain at room temperature after collection if transport to the lab will be delayed? Oh, we have a lot of different options and I'm not seeing the correct one being chosen. That means you guys need to review this. You guys need to review this because we are not strong in this, my friends. We are not strong in this right now. The struggle is too real. So let's go back to this slide. If transport is delayed, some specimens may be refrigerated, urine, stool, or sputum. Others should be maintained at room temperatures, genital, eye, and spinal fluid. So which of the following specimens can remain at room temperature? cerebral spinal fluid. Once again, it needs to be transported to the lab within one hour, right? Don't mess around. Don't let the nurses hold on to it, okay? That's not how life works. You can't just hold on to it. Okay, so we're gonna stop here um, and we're gonna do our group member spotlight and then our week three assignments. So our group member for this week is Paola Botero. She's from Osceola County. She has a four month old baby girl named Katie and a three year old son. His name is Ethan. She likes to grow bonsai trees with her husband, which I think is really cool because I cannot I can I can keep dogs alive, but I cannot keep plants alive. Um, her favorite shows are Alienist, Breaking Bad and Game of Thrones. Her favorite movie, movie is Titanic, and her favorite actor is Leonardo DiCaprio. She actually lived in France for one month, and she also lived in Belgium for three weeks. And she is a Zumba instructor. She's been teaching Zumba. This is her right at the front since 2016, and she really loves it, and she loves to dance. Okay. So our week three assignments. So these are our, us, oh, Dios mio, I apologize. My pronunciation game has not been at its best today. Um, but so for our action items, our assigned chapter readings for next week are going to be chapters 36 on pneumonia, chapters 95 on tuberculosis, chapters 72 on Clostridium difficile, chapters 82 on influenza, 
And then I need to make sure that you guys watch the YouTube lecture on infectious disease, the antibiotic ladder. What I may do is I may, we did miss out on a couple of slides um, that I was not able to present today. Would you guys prefer that we have a little bit of a, a longer meeting um, next week, like adding 30 minutes onto it? Or would you just want me to record the remaining part of, the, of this lecture today and then send it out so you guys are able to watch it sometime during the week um, to make sure we, that we cover it? Okay, okay, so we have, <laughs> okay, you guys, I'm going to have to count these up. It's kind of split right now between longer meetings and um, recordings, so I'll, I'll count it up and then let you guys know via email. I hope today was really helpful for y'all. Um, I have a lot of fun putting these together for you guys, um, and I hope that you're realizing that you do need to make sure you're doing your readings and that you're reviewing everything. Um, that is it for today. You guys have a wonderful weekend. Make sure you get your readings done, your lectures looked at, and um, you guys have a great weekend. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. I'm getting some messages still, but <laughs> you're welcome, Stephanie. Bye, Liza. Bye, guys. I'll see you guys next week.